Check the lens cover. Oh, let's open up the lens cover. Perfect ticket. All right, good evening, everyone. Sorry, we're in a big room, so it's kind of hard to, uh, maybe hard to hear us. I don't know if you guys can hear me well in the back. Uh, welcome to the Board of Supervisors meeting for Thursday, March 7th. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Father, we thank you for this, this time together as citizens of this community. Give us the strength to keep this community joined as neighbors to work forward through this year of, of trial that we're coming upon. And give us the strength and faith and to be the light in the community. We thank you in all Heavenly Father's name. Amen. Amen. This meeting is being recorded for rebroadcasting purposes. No executive sessions held. Public comment, five minute period limit per uh, comment on agenda items. Please come forward to the front here to the left. If you have any uh, public comment on the agenda. Yeah. meeting, but for those of you who might not have been there or heard, uh, the primary responsibility of the assistant township manager is to back up two positions, myself and that of the finance director. Uh, so in specific, the assistant township manager will be training on all things finance. She will be, begin working in zoning and subdivision shortly. She's also going to be preparing grants and uh, a number of other projects. Uh, she is a uh, graduate of James Madison University uh, for a bachelor's degree in public administration. She graduated with a master's in public administration from James Madison University uh, about three and a half years ago. And uh, since that time, she's been working in two municipalities in Delaware. Okay, and the other question was, what would her salary be? 725. 725. Thank you. Anyone else? Don Miller, on the agenda tonight, there's an item for deputy tax collector appointment. Um, maybe you might be covering it later on. Uh, in March 5th of this year, in the newspaper, Larry wrote that, and uh, I'll just read it in a rebuttal letter. Uh, it was shared with the Langston newspaper a reporter reporting claims she probably filed the bonding information when she became tax collector in 22. The documents bonding her and her deputy were filed with former supervisor O.C. and former township Mike Hessian. In fact, Carrasco later confirmed there have not been any changes to the deputy tax collector position since the township approved it in 2022. So you may be covering that later on, but there's an article that says she is, but here it says she didn't appoint it. So, I don't need an answer now, I'm sure you're covered later or something. Anyone else? Oh, she wasn't appointed. <clears throat> Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, our discussion and presentations. We have the consultants for Denver Road Partners LLC. Welcome. Thank you. 
what we tried to do with this elevation is incorporate some more natural color so it might not stand out as much against the landscape as, as some others might. Um, we're open to feedback on this. This is an initial concept to sort of start the conversation. But we know there's a desire from the board to, to see warehousing done in a way that is uh, more visually attractive and, and more in keeping with the surrounding community, especially in this location. I think we would move forward giving the proximity to the residential. So to walk you through the text amendment itself, if you want to refer to page five, that plan will show you what we're proposing in terms of a reason. Basically the western side of the property, the westernmost 19 acre tract, and then the existing area that zones mobile home park would be reason to I-1 industrial. And then the balance of the property would remain in R2. There's a slight adjustment to the lot line that would be proposed, and that would simply be to allow for additional buffering <coughs> the industrial tract separated from the residential property. There are a few tax amendments that would also be required in connection with this rezoning. Uh, the first few amendments all related to increasing density on the site. So we are proposing to increase density on sites within the R2 district that contain 15 acres or more. The thinking there is, you know, we understand there may be a concern about going higher density on smaller properties where it may have more impacts on the surrounding neighbors. When you have a large tract of land, we think that's probably a more appropriate place to do denser development. It's going to have less impacts and you're going to be able to do more with the site to balance those impacts on the joint property. So the text amendments that I'm going to talk about here as they relate to density would all pertain only to tracts that contain 15 acres or more. Currently in the R2 zoning district, which is the township's high density zoning district, you can only get a maximum of five dwelling units per acre. There are some other districts where you can achieve a little bit higher density in the township, but this is really falling short of what places 2020 would be having us target, which would be a minimum of 7.5 units per acre within the urban growth area. So what we're proposing, did I actually say 2020? <laughs> 2040. So what we're proposing here would be to increase the density to 12 units per acre on lots containing 15 acres or more in the Arctic. So a pretty limited application would allow us to go a lot higher density on this site. We're also <coughs> proposing to decrease parking requirements, again, on lots containing 15 acres or more in the R2 district. Currently, your ordinance requires two spaces per multifamily dwelling unit. We're proposing one and a half. That's consistent with what the ITE would recommend in terms of parking for multifamily buildings of this character. And then finally, with regard to building height, we're proposing to increase the building height to 65 feet, and that would allow us to do the five-story buildings on the property. There are a few changes that we would also be proposing to the industrial criteria to allow for the development of this site. Section 222023H4 of your ordinance requires a 50-foot setback completely devoted to landscaping between any I-1 lot that would enjoy a residential use. And that applies to buildings, structures, storage, parking, loading, etc. So we would be proposing to remove structures from that list of things to which the setback requirement would apply. That would allow us to have access driveways within that 50 foot setback. And also proposing that the landscaping required by that section could be moved elsewhere on the property in circumstances where site conditions would preclude it from being constructed in that buffer. If you look at our sketch plan dated March 6th, you will see that we are proposing landscaping in that buffer where we can accommodate it. But in the case of this project in particular, we're doing a floodplain restoration, or we hope to be doing a floodplain restoration that would be, need to be fully <coughs> evaluated but that would preclude us from being able to install landscaping along the entire property line. So we're just looking to add some language to the ordinance that would recognize that site conditions may include a developer from being able to install that 50 foot landscape buffer. We're also proposing a change to section 2220 23J, 
That section prohibits off street loading from being located on any side of a building adjoining land within a residential zone or facing an adjoining street. You can see this property has sort of Denver Road wraps around it, so it's got street frontage on two sides. It's got the turnpike to the rear. If the rezoning is approved, uh, it will also have the residential property to the east, so it functionally would preclude us from being able to put loading on any side of the building. So what we're proposing for this amendment is if a property had frontage on two or more streets, that loading would be permitted within the front yard, but it would have to remain outside of the front yard setback. So setback from the road, but uh, could be within, you know, between the building and the street, which is how your ordinance defines the front yard. And then finally, section 22023N requires a visual screen along lands uh, that are adjacent, and again, this is in the industrial district to a residential zoning district. Really, it's very similar language to the first section we discussed about that buffer strip. This section does not talk about what exactly is supposed to be within that screen. But again, we would just be looking to add language that would recognize that there may be circumstances where that's not possible based on the site conditions and, and that where that occurs, that landscaping or plannings could be placed elsewhere on the property. So I'll pause there for a minute. I am going to have Kat walk you through the plan in a little bit more detail, but before I do that, are there any questions about the part that I just went over? Well, and then you'll, you'll fire away. She okay. might be answering a few more questions. All right, go ahead, Ken. Uh, so if you went back to the March, March 6th plan we provided, um, just as reference. So in general, the existing conditions of the, the land are the slippery topography. Um, Turnpike in this area does sit up a little bit higher than our existing property. And then additionally, if you notice, you know, we are, there is maybe some streams going through the site. Um, that we are talking about doing public mm -hmm. restoration then too. So you should, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I do have a light, I do have a soft voice. I hear it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so we, um, the, but the stormwater management in general, the sloping nature of the property, it all does drain to the existing drainage feature going through the property. Um, additionally, there are some uh, existing mobile homes that are currently on the site, um, as well as a resident but the residents in the farm. Um, the warehouse will be on the western side of the property near um, the existing industrial uses, and as Claudia mentioned, consists of 177,900 square foot building. The residents will be on the western side, near the existing mobile home park, consisting of four to five, or five, four five-story buildings on the north side of the floodplain, and two three-story buildings along Denver Road. As I mentioned, um, the grading is really set up so that the warehouse sits into the grade um, and really grades to, to the front um, to the existing plug and restoration. We do feel that the uh, warehouse is kind of nicely bounded by the um, by the turnpike to the north and by the plug and restoration and some additional um, potential options for mounting. Uh, and buffering along Denver Road, as you can see, a little bit north of Denver Road, noted um, by the communities. Additionally, um, utilities will be served by public um, water and sewer. Uh, parking and loading, the warehouses as shown on here, will provide employee parking um, to the north, loading to unloading base um, to the south. You can see the residential parking, uh, as Claudia described, the one plant fire spaces for a unit and it's provided in to uh, the residential units. Um, the traffic and circulation, um, the residential um, um, will come off Denver Road, across the floodplain, and into uh, the five-story uh, buildings to the north of the, of the stream. We do um, conceptually are looking to provide a, uh, emergency access between the, um, the apartment building and warehouse for fire and emergency use. Um, conceptually it's graded in there um, and you can see a little break in the uh, in the trees in order to provide that. Uh, and we are providing for the warehouse building we 
access to it again from Denver Road. We have a narrow providing a secondary access a little bit further uh, north on Denver Road, but again, for emergency access. The landscaping and buffering, as I mentioned, we did particularly um, intend to buffer the warehouse warehouse use from the residential use, and then additionally to provide an additional buffer from the <coughs> road um, and the residential and industrial use itself. Any questions about that? I don't see, I don't see any buffering on the current plan uh, where you guys are showing the three-story buildings, the two up top here, with the mobile home park. Were, were you guys thinking about putting any uh, buffering of, uh, right there from the apartment buildings to the mobile home? So one issue in that area, we can look at some buffering options. You can see on the plan, there's a lot of utilities there. And that does provide you know, issues with some larger things that could go there. Um, certainly, I think there are some low-level things that could go there. It's just with the concern that possibly there's water. Uh, that, were, that was going to be my next question. Claudia had mentioned about uh, doing like a pre-planning with some of the staff at the township, or is that what you said, Claudia? Yeah. Um, was the water authority involved at all by chance? Because I know they have. Yeah. Did they have any concerns about? Uh, they have. They have one of their wells there. I think uh, we're currently experiencing some. Well, they're experiencing some issues right over here with one of the, the, the developments and sinkholes and stuff like that and I don't know if you know what, what they commented over there since we're actually getting so close I see there's a line there and I'm assuming that's a setback from from like their wellhead yeah I actually think that their wellhead is not on our property correct it's, it's you know that's actually our property line there in red it is colored in like the rest of it, so it makes it a little bit clearer. But I don't recall them raising, and Tommy can disagree, I don't recall them raising any of those concerns. Yeah, but yeah, so we certainly could discuss them. Uh, okay, I, I see it down here. Yeah, I apologize. The coloring does go, does go through it. Um, also, I mean, just in general, without getting into uh, a lot of the details of public and restoration, it does significantly increase connectivity between the, uh, if, if applicable, between the actual stream and groundwater. Um, so typically it is it is something that you know increases well capacity or could potentially increase groundwater. Um, actually because of the interaction between the stream and groundwater more effectively. Okay. Is still question time for us? Yeah, of course. So uh, when I saw this plan come to us, uh, I think it was two weeks ago when Tommy sent sent it out. I looked over it. Obviously, did my due diligence. Um, I reached out to one of our fire chiefs from Reamstown because we have a ladder truck there and stuff. And that's where I told Tommy, "Hey, maybe they can look at going up a little more, get more density." I like that. I, I see that it eliminated some of the buildings because we had what eight buildings total before, mm -hmm. so now we're down to six. Um, and the uh, where they felt comfortable with the reach with the ladder truck would have been the five, five, five stories. Perfect. And uh, I wanted to share that with you guys. And they said uh, up to like a 70 foot reach. And I think you guys are trying to change it to 65. Mm -hmm. I guess the ladder truck's a 100 foot ladder, uh, but with their setbacks and all that, they're comfortable reaching at 70, at 70 feet. So that that's obviously a positive if we're trying to talk density, uh, higher density. Um, my question would be, could could the two front buildings as well be five, uh, you know, be five stories? Uh, the calculations I had done, I'm sure you guys have this as well. Um, it's right here. It, it, I was thinking if, if obviously I don't think we're going to reach, be able to have all these buildings because of parking. I saw that you guys were going from two to one and a half, so that helped a little bit. Um, eight apartment buildings with five floors, that would have been 40 apartments per building. We'd be looking at 320 apartments, so we're looking at like 128 more than just, um, I guess, what is it, 20 some more like this? Yeah, we're at 208 right now. 208 from 192. So that'd be, I don't have my calculator, but okay. A good increase. Yeah. 
a little bit of an increase. Yeah. How, how, you know, you nailed the nail on the head. It, part of the whole uh, place is 2040, and everyone's talking about high density housing. And, you know, I've made this proposal even when Benderson presented their other plan there mm -hmm. for, their, for their track. We don't have that. We don't offer that in East Cocalico. And, and obviously, uh, you know, it'll lead to another question. Can't the warehouses go away and, and make that whole track high density apartments? I mean, we, we really we really need it. We're right at we're at a great location uh, with with the 222 turnpike, and a lot of people want to be here, but we don't have we're not offering that. Yeah. So I'll I'll let Andy take that one. I think, and and I, I guess I'll start out by saying I think Andy can probably speak to this better on behalf of ownership, but making the numbers work to be profitable on this kind of housing is really, really challenging. So I, what's happening here is your industrial use is really Thank supplement, you. it's making it work um, from a numbers perspective. I, I so figured that's, that's what yeah. the answer would have been, but I wanted to throw it out there. So, that was, uh, before you, my, my question real quick, if, I, if you don't mind, I'm sorry. I was gonna ask you what, if we're putting 40 units in there, what is the average square footage of each unit? So, all right, let me, let me take a step back. I'm Andy Miller with, with Catalyst Commercial Development. We're the, the subsidiary of the applicant, uh, Denver Road Associates, um, this project. So to answer the first question about the apartments in the front, and if we were to make them instead of three-story, five-story, our concern was the parking. Mm -hmm. uh, just simply having enough room out there without adding parking to the left of the access driveway, you know, that makes it cumbersome for, for residents going back and forth. And we have our driveway located there on Denver Road at kind of the best spot around that stretch of road that's a curve from a site distance standpoint and kind of a safety point. So that was one reason. We also wanted to be a bit respectful of the height of the buildings that close to the roadway and the other residences. So the five-story building is kind of being set back over the floodplain and tucked further back into the site. Um, you know, to us just felt a little less intrusive than having five stories right there along the road. Um, so with, with, without having trees there, not being able to put trees there, even two stories is going to kind of be overwhelming to those people, yeah, uh, in my can, opinion. Yeah, we can see what we can do to soften that up and, you know, maybe we flip the building and the parking so it's not as close, the building isn't as close to the, to the property line. I mean, the, the, legitimately, as far as you see, as, as far as we have this engineer right now, can, can definitely be moved around. Absolutely. So, um, so don't forget all the questions. So to the point about the, the labor force, Claudia is exactly correct. The industrial uh, facility, there is a need for that. So our company just leased out, built and leased out um, the 117,000 square foot building on the other side of the interchange, right across the street from Acme. Um, it's just, the tenant just moved in a few weeks ago. A uh, nice new shiny building. We're super excited about it to be in the township. It was a great purchase for our, our uh, company. It's now leased up. You know, you, you can't get any closer to the turnpike than that than that facility um, since we bought turnpike land. So th there's definitely we have found a need for this size facility uh, in the township and in the area, especially given the locale. In addition to that, to to make this type of affordable housing work and workforce housing, you know, with even a lack of, let's say, uh, high-end amenities that some apartment complexes are now pushing very heavily, um, we need some offset there. We need that industrial project to help offset to be able to make them, you know, uh, um, I don't want to say cheaper, that's not the right word, but, you know, more affordable for workforce. But make your pension, to make your project pension. Yeah, yeah I, and that's exactly what it is in, in full transparency. So if uh, if these types of apartments were huge money makers for us, we'd cover the whole project with them. Um, but that's not really what we're seeing in the demand. The other thing is as you build apartment buildings that are higher um, and have more units in them, you, you typically can't build as many buildings at a time. You know, so you may build one building, uh, wait for it to get half leased before you start the next building. It, it's a cash flow thing. Um, to the, the size of units and the square footage in them, so typically these buildings would be a mixture of one, two, and three bedroom garden style apartments. You know, um, to the square footage, I don't know that yet. We don't. We haven't really honed in on that. This is 
a typical apartment footprint that is that the industry uses, but every user that kind of takes these, um, you know, fits out the, the unit style a little different within that footprint. Um, so they may they may start with one that's more two and ones, and then they may get into more three bedrooms later. Um, it just all depends on what that user uh, would want. And as we would get further along in the process, we would get that user engaged with us. We would then, you know, start working through at that land development time. Really, this is our breakdown of apartments, uh, of units, and the size of those units. You know, which helps uh, factor into the parking discussion as well. Um, you know, we know that, that a three-bedroom unit may very well have two vehicles. Um, you know, but let's be honest, the one bedroom most likely is going to have one. That's where that one and a half of the parking space is really the sweet spot. I mean, we have some, the, the, some parking studies. Obviously, the IT backs that up with all their, you know, thousands of, of studies and data. Um, so that's really the reason that we're looking at it. Um, we also are excited about the floodplain restoration because, um, you know, that is something that is, is greatly beneficial to our project where by removal of that legacy sediment, we're able to use that for infiltration and for stormwater management. So it helps reduce our on-site costs from the stormwater management aspect, even though we're going to floodplain restoration. Um, but that has a lot of ecological benefits, also has benefits to the township through the MS4 program. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of benefits to that. Um, it's no one should think that that is a cheap way out or an easy way to go. Floodplain restoration typically costs as much, if not a couple dollars more than traditional stormwater basins on site. Um, but if given the site and given the way the floodplain is in the stream, it makes sense. But not every stream is a good candidate, or not every floodplain um, can, can get the benefits out of it. But we've worked with some consultants to study that so far that are pretty sure we can get some good back to the that. I guess my question about square foot per, per unit was to see what type of Rental, they're all going to be rentals, obviously. They would be, yes. Okay, so yes. just to see what kind of rental income and clientele you would be. And, and that's something that we would we would hone in tighter. We already have a market study, and we would hone that in tighter with the end user um, as to what their you know their their market study and our market study combined would would set the what makes sense for the lease for rate uh, per square footage per bedroom. But we, I don't have that information right But I think we are comfortable saying that this is, we're trying to target this towards a workforce housing demographic and an attainable housing price point. So, you know, and, and lack of amenities and other features like that are some of the things that we're allowed to do that. So that's important. Are you guys trying to be, I'm sorry, I'm say that. Are you guys, are you guys going to be developing this to keep it or sell it or? Sure. So we have, right, we have several projects across Lancaster County already. Um, like I said, the one across the street, we're holding that one. That'll be a long-term asset for our company. Uh, what we've been doing in this instance is, and, and partially for the reason of the subdivision, is we would hold on to the industrial building. That would be a long-term asset of ours. We would sell off the apartment land to a apartment user or, you know, someone that that is. We don't run apartments. We just do permits and approvals and, and get the right person in to, to build them and then operate them down the road. So we would vet out that person and get that person on board. Um, we may help with site construction. We may help with you know all kinds of um, utility work, the floor plan restoration. But actually going vertical and operating it, that's not something. Okay. Talked about flood plan restoration. Does that go from one end of the property all the way? Typically, yes, it would go, our, our property would, it would end at the culvert that goes under Denver Road, and then that would continue the whole stretch up to where it either covers the property line or sometimes there's a, a cone-shaped area that sometimes you need to get an easement on an adjoining property just to make the grading work and to make the, the, the plantings work. Um, so sometimes that does stretch on. It all depends on, on the depth and the amount of sediment and all the engineering stuff that goes into that, where you actually end it. And we, we rely on our biologists to, to tell us that. Yeah. The intent of floodplain restoration is to increase the surface area of the floodplain itself, the floodway. And so at any point, sometimes the grading can um, go off off the site, or maybe you just stop a little bit before the end of the site, just based on the grading in that area. Your drawing there shows that the 
current stream, uh, I guess, deviates out of the, the restoration area. Does that mean the stream gets redirected in, in uh, that location? Or that so typically with floodplain restoration, what they, what they do is they look at the entire reach or the entire section of the stream. And what they do is, no matter which way the stream may go today, they rebuild it. So it's rebuilt into a very, um, uh, like a, yeah, like a braided um, way that helps to keep the velocity of the water down. And then along with all the plant things that they add within that flow plane, um, within the restoration part of it, helps to increase infiltration and groundwater recharge and so forth. So. When you look at our stream now, the final product would, would look like almost like a stream, you know, serpentine through the whole thing. That, that's typically how they're done. Uh, and the ones that have been done in other sections, we were part of one, uh, and, and previous employer I was part of two, and um, it's it just been very beneficial. Um, what the, the ultimate results out of them, um, um, you know, between the conservation district and DEP and, and the developers alike, um, they just turned out to be great projects. They also do a great job of, um, as opposed to having potentially underground facility that you don't see, you know, it's providing for more management and it's directly visible. Um, so it was terms of like long term maintenance and care, it's right there in front of you. Um, they have a, like less long term maintenance and care um, because of, there's less actual physical structures in it. You know, you're not talking about mirrors or baffles or anything like that. Um, and to Andy's point, visually, um, you know, when you go a lot of times like this would be a good example, you can stand and see where the health care restoration is and isn't. You can tell the, you know, tell visually the increased habitat and the floodplain that exists during in the floodplain restoration area. So in this kind of design, then there there is no holding uh, uh, facility. It's all done in the, in the restoration. That would be our intent. We would go in and study how much legacy sediment can be removed. They do infiltration testing within the floodplain area. And then we would hope that all of our management can be done within that. So you're correct, there's no underground systems, there's no surface basins. Uh, it's all here within the floodplain itself. Um, and and uh, DEP and the Army Corps have a very stringent set of regulations to basically let you use that as your stormwater management. Um, it's, it's not just a check box and you walk away, it's freeing them. I think, uh, yeah, just to, to enhance what Amy said, additionally, there is testing that's necessary to see what the, like, what the hydro capacity is of that area. So if it does turn out that it, it, it doesn't quite have enough capacity, we may close other small small water management facilities. But to Amy's point, that's because of the strength of nature of the regulations on public land. There's another area that's almost square. It's, it's blue color there. What, what is that uh, function of that? That's an existing pond yeah. on, the pro on the property. Um, we don't intend to do anything with that at the time. But at this time, a part of the project is basically we go in. Pretty swimming here. <laughs> when it comes to the location of the warehouse there, it shows all the loading docks facing Denver Road. Um, is, it, is it a possibility to flip that around that the truck traffic would be facing the turnpike and not Denver Road? Um, so the reality is from the car parking, the existing grade from the car parking on the north side to where we have our entrance drive coming in on the south side is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 feet of elevation change. So we're even anticipating that the car parking is going to be set up higher than the finished floor of the building. There might be a retaining wall in there or another slope in there because we're trying to tear down as we come across that grade. Um, when you drive by the site and you look at it, it doesn't seem that immense of a grade change until you start putting in flat pads. Um, so from a grading and an earthwork standpoint, it would be extremely expensive to build retaining walls to cut into on the north and then fill up against walls on the south side to try to bend in that whole building. So that's why we have to, you know, the loading dock is only a four foot elevation change, but on a site like this, every foot helps. That was our reason, reasoning for that. Again, that truck, that truck loading area is not up at, directly up against Denver Road. You know, if, if we were in that scenario, I think we would look at something different. 
So again, I think that distance helps, um, you know, helps the, the visualization. How much higher than that in your uh, basin there they have? How much higher is that loading? You said there's a 70 foot grade change. How much higher? Yeah, so I think we're from, and this is one off memory, um, when you come in off Denver Road with our driveway for the industrial, so you get up to the dock area, I think we climb uh, somewhere around 25 or 30 feet up that driveway to get up into the, the truck dock area. Uh, I was trying to picture that in my head, and I think what Jeff was probably getting at too is that hill is above a valley that goes down across the neighbors or across the street. And uh, noise from the top of that valley, across from the top of that hill across that valley, would probably may be an issue with, for the residents that live down across there. What's that? In the apartments for the Yeah. So across that valley would be some some noise concerns. So I can just sort of take it. So I was thinking the same thing. It was possible for all the backside. Has been shown right there across the street. Yeah, and then over here, Pepperidge Farm has a couple, right? and all their docks are facing that right now. They all are high up here. High up here. This is K. This is Kalis and Sylvan. Kalis is right here. Sylvan's up here. Highs up here. Highs. This is this is the high point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's the truck. current ones their their docks are facing them the road a lot the majority of the roastlings are on the back side I think they're on the back side so but the years was still fit Yeah, we have 54 shown there right now. The reality is to get a user in there and add some stair sessions and a few other things in there. We'll probably lose a couple of drivers. <laughs> <doors. laughs> uh, a uh, question, because I, I know you guys, uh, you're building there on um, Muddy Creek. Mm -hmm. That was empty for quite, quite some time. Unfortunately, it was, yes. Uh, so obviously I, I keep hearing it from residents, you know, these warehouses go up. Do they have do they have a tenant? Do, or, do they already have an end user or are they building and uh, doing the sign of the cross 150 times a day that someone's gonna come in and rent it? Or you know, how, how do you guys how what's how do you guys approach it with your business? So what we find in our industry and we, we're dealing with this when we're with the warehouse we're building down in uh, Reams right now. Uh, outside of town that's about 380,000 square feet. And when most of the tenant RFPs, when they send you their list, um, the first thing they want to know is what tax incentives you can provide them. The second thing they want to know is how many months free rent they can get. And the third question they always ask is, how quick can we get in? So if you have a building that's not sitting, shiny, ready to go, you're off the list and they're off to the next person. So what that building sat, while it, while it seemed to be vacant for a long time, these leases with some of these national companies, the company that's in that is a very large company. It took eight months to negotiate that lease, and it wasn't even that complicated of a, of a lease, you know, to lease the building. The speed that the industry moves is not as fast as you would think, but if you are going to lease a building up and you don't have a user for starting construction, you need to have the, the building finished and ready to go. Um, so that one was, it actually was leased a lot earlier than what it looked like until they started moving into it. The other thing you have to realize is people see these warehouses and they say, well, they're sitting empty, there's no one there. They may have a lease and someone doesn't really need to occupy it for eight or nine months, but they need, if they don't get on the, if they don't get the building leased and they don't get the space, they're out in the next tenant's in. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of these companies that are going out leasing up buildings. They may not need them for a couple months, but they can't wait. You know, they need to get their lease signed. It takes a while to get through the lease. Believe the attorneys, uh, you know, tear, tear, <laughs> the attorneys tear these things apart. It's, it's, uh, it, our job's easy compared to, to working through the lease for these companies. 
So it, it does make, you know, we always need to be out ahead. We, we have some projects too where we have warehouses that are in the Lehigh Valley area, for example. We have malt ready, permitted, and approved. All we need to do is post aspirin and record the LB plan. But there, we want to get a user because of the size of the facility and the market is over there. Um, so every market's different, every site's different, the building size, you know, can fluctuate. Um, and, and it's, I don't have a great answer, but that's, that's what I got. That's about the most I accurate. figured I'd ask just, yeah. A lot of people ask, and they don't come to meetings and ask the question, so I might as well ask it. Yep. And yep. I can report back when they ask. Yep. Yeah, no, it's a, I tell you what, if, if we had a silver ball and, and or, you know, blow Exactly, you know, that we, we can do that, but it, uh, the best thing is to have a building there ready to go. Are you at a different who's leasing the other building? Uh, someone very local, someone who has a lot of real estate in the township already. Maybe across the road. Uh, they could be connected with someone you're not yet. <laughs> do you, uh, since you said that the apartment buildings and I don't know, would be built by probably somebody else, or uh, do you see that as something that would uh, start reasonably soon as, as improvements were there, or would it, would it be sitting for years waiting for somebody to come along? So the, the tough thing with apartment buyers and, and builders and operators is that they don't want to be, they're kind of like single family builders. They don't want to come into the party and be there too early, and they don't want to be really part of any of the upfront work while we're going here. So we won't even go out to market to them until we, and we have a, a very deep list of folks that would be very interested in the site until we get our zoning approval. Until we can go to them and say, this has now become a real project. We still have to go through land development and all these other items, but we have zoning approval, this is gonna become real. Then they start to get interested. Um, some, some apartment folks, they may say, we don't think it's real until you have a user in your uh, uh, industrial facility, you know, and we know that there's employees there to be in our apartment. So everyone operates a little bit differently, but typically um, they would, pro I can say almost for certainty, the apartments would not start to get built or constructed until the building is at least well under construction. Until the warehouse. Until the warehouse is well under construction, that's correct. Unless we get an apartment person that says, man, this is a hot market, I want to be there, I'll lay the dollars out up front and I'll start building right away. And you never know that could happen. We have people popping out of the woodwork for an apartment project we've never heard of or seen before. And they find you get approvals and how they find the stuff out. If you find those approvals and you get 309 units and they want. My, uh, go back to my first question then. Uh, let's look at down where the five story buildings are at. Would you guys be able to get another building in there? Squeeze another building and some parking in there? Or? Right now, when we looked at that and we did look at that as a group, um, what we're hung up with a little bit is the available parking for another building. That's our concern. Um, you know, dropping it down to let's say we even did the scenario where we went a space per unit, or 1.25 spaces per unit. Uh, the problem is we don't have a lot of available area to build, let's say, a reserve parking area should more parking be needed down the road. And we design and permit it, but maybe we don't construct it until we very need it. Um, we don't really have a lot of room in that area out there uh, to do that. So, by looking at the old plan, and looking at the new one, like towards, let's say, the, the triangle part up here on the new plan, uh -huh. right? Um, and looking at the old plan, the buildings are shifted up a little further because you have four there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe we'd be able to squeeze out a, a three-story in, in there and, and still be able to get some parking, like towards the triangle. You, you know, you guys would have to, you guys would have to do your numbers, see if it works or. You know, even, even a two-story, I, I think something would be better than nothing at this point if, you know, you want to maximize the coverage that, you know, that, that you can get. Yeah, yeah we can definitely take a look. It'll be, it'll be 
one of a kind in the in the townships because we don't have another high density like this, you know, going up. I'm not too keen on warehouses. I've said it many times, but there's there's locations that it makes sense. There's locations that doesn't. 272 doesn't make sense. You got something smacking you right in the face. You know where the other warehouses are at. It, you know, it could make sense. I'm not saying it does, but it could. Uh, and I, I'm big on design. Like, you, if you look, if you look at just uh, concrete walls, kind of looks kind of lean. You know, like, uh, it's another warehouse. Uh, I, you know, I'm not saying it has to be like that, but there, there's so many different designs out there of warehousing that people think 13 times and say, "Is that a warehouse?" You know, but just just options, you know, if you, you know, if this moves forward, just keep that in consideration, maybe, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to send us images of what you're thinking about, that, I think that would be helpful for us. Because it, when you get into the aesthetics, it does become sort of a, a preference thing. And so, yeah, I'd be happy to take a look at what you have. You know, somebody I walk, somebody that drives by and says, wow, that's a beautiful building. I've never heard one person say that about a warehouse, you know? I say, oh. <laughs> You're looking at the dollar signs. <laughs> well, and, and on the point, you know, this being an industrial area, we definitely think that the, the warehouse does fit in with the industrial nature of the area. You've got, you know, high concrete, you've got all the other industries around there. But we also recognize the need for, you know, the, the workforce housing. We appreciate that. That's something we can definitely do. Uh, and that other corner of the other area where we have the apartment shown doesn't lend itself to add another building or something else over there. It's just, it's not big enough. It's bifurcated by the, the stream down the middle and the floodplain, and it just, you know, how we get to it reasonably. And so we felt that that was, that was jamming too much on, on the site by trying to put another industrial use there. Um, but, you know, the township has a need and we can help achieve it. Well, I'm glad I don't see the truck parking here, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> All right, we'll open it up to the public. Yeah, if anyone has any questions for, for the presenters. <clears throat> yes, sir. Doug Mackley. Uh, this well house that's over here in the very corner, mm -hmm. you, I think you stated earlier this kind of sheets downhill, the topography of the land. Mm -hmm. How are you going to protect that well house? Because I know you're not from around here, but this community has 13 well sites. They're all holes in the ground. We're not allowed to take water out of the river or the creek out here because that is used down at the upper treatment plant where all the sewage goes. So if we were to lose one of those well houses because of contamination in the ground or whatever, that's all I'm looking for. I know you can't give me an answer, but you need to really think long and hard about that. I know Lorenzo asked you or someone asked, did you talk to talk with the water and sewer trucks? That's going to be a concern of theirs. Like I said, we have 13 wells in this whole township. And that's where our whole sole source of water comes from. So. I understand and we appreciate the concern about the sewer system. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, has any thought been put into <coughs> some sort of sound barriers between the apartments and the turnpike? The turnpike runs 24-7. It's going to be a very noisy environment for residences. We haven't gotten that far yet.
moving forward to action items, uh, past meeting minutes for approval, gentlemen. I had no idea. 